Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Demon Hunter, a 1975 offering from Atlas Seaboard Comics. This was one of the last comics they published. Uh, Atlas Seaboard lasted about a year, from late 74 to late 75, and this was the last, I don't think any titles were published after September 75. But it's a great one. And um, this is the origin story. And just this character is just... There could be thousands of stories about this guy. It was just a really good concept. Kind of groovy, weird costume. He had cool powers. Very flawed character. Uh, like many Atlas Comics characters were. But uh, it, it's the brainchild of Rich Buckler. And Rich Buckler was a... You know, long time mainstream comic artist. He uh, came around 1970, uh, took over Fantastic Four from Jack Kirby, and he tried to draw like Jack Kirby. And then later on, he tried to draw like other people. He was kind of a chameleon. and uh, But he was very reliable, I guess. So he'd get tons of work. You'd always see Rich Buckler in 70s Marvel comics. And even later on, he did stuff for DC, but mostly Marvel. He does the cover here. It looks like a, a really bad heavy metal album cover. Uh, not the best artwork from Rich Buckler. Rich Buckler was hit, hit, hit or miss. Every now and then he could do some like beautiful page or something. Not beautiful, but pretty damn nice. Um, his early stuff uh, with Don McGregor on Black Panther, I think he did the first two issues, maybe just the first one. Really nice stuff, but that had a good anchor. This is a uh, him. Uh, penciling and inking. And there's some decent stuff in here, but also some wonky stuff. I like this opening page. It's just kind of a, kind of like a mini origin. Just, uh, it says, what does a demon hunter do? I like how this groovy lettering is in the cape. And, uh, the answer is everything he can to prevent xenogenesis, the rebirth of a demon race on earth. His name is Gideon Cross. He's a telepath. And he's more. As a harvester of eyes for a mysterious cult, he has been endowed with certain powers. Among them, a shadow cloak that materializes arcane weaponry from the beyond. That was one of his cool powers. He almost had this, like, uh, portal into a pocket dimension in his cloak. So he could pull out any kind of weaponry. For some reason, it's never like an Uzi. It's always like arcane weaponry, like a sword or a halberd or a pike. It's, he never, you know, takes out a, a rifle or anything or a pistol. And so we get a nice intro page. So I, I really like which part does some de nice design stuff, you know? This is a very appealing for a superhero comic. Even though this is kind of a hybrid, it's almost like a superhero monster comic. Which is another reason why I wish there was more issues of this. Because uh, <laughs> it's it's a fun idea. I've never seen Rich Buckler draw like this. Um, maybe because I've never seen him without an inker. But there's some almost like rough hewn panels. Where it almost reminds me slightly of like Frank Thorne, Joe Kubert. We'll see more. But I have, usually he's more slick. But the way he inks himself, sometimes it's very, like, rough-hewn and uh, kind of nice. I like this first page. This was a thing that I think was only in the 70s. These pages with, like, this many panels trying to be very cinematic. I think they were probably influenced by Jim Steranko. And, uh, you know, he was always trying to be cinematic. We see this hitman up on a cliff, and uh, he's gonna take out this this rich guy at his mansion. He's having a soiree at his mansion, and he has a kind of look at that. There's a very Kubert-y looking little uh, panel. Then there's even tinier panels. <laughs> I mean, this is like every split second cinematically. You know what's going on. He senses that someone's behind him. The sniper. 
and he turns around and he's correct. It's Demon Hunter, the Harvester of Eyes. And there's a little asterisk here and it says dedicated to Buck Dharma and the boys. That's a Blue Oyster Cult reference because this comic was scripted by David Anthony Kraft. Uh, you know, the you probably know him, 70s Marvel Comics. Uh, he was like the poor man Steve Gerber. He was doing weirder stuff than most uh, writers. Uh, it's almost like he looked up to Steve Gerber and was trying to do what he was doing. And he loved Blue Oyster Cult. And in fact, he had, a, I think in the Defenders, he had these characters called the Agents of Fortune show up. And he always had titles that were Blue Oyster Cult songs. This logo is kind of, actually looks like 50s Atlas comics. That looks so old school. So here we go. Richard F. Buckler, concept, plot, and art. So he pretty much did everything. And then I guess he didn't feel confident with his dialoguing skills or writing the captions. So we got David Anthony Kraft to help him out. The lettering is by Shelley Lefferman. Perhaps that's why the logo was so lackluster. We never heard of them again. <laughs> They've Maybe not the best. Though it all seems fine, the normal lettering, you know. It's a really weird costume. Kind of predates Spawn. Having that gigantic cape that just seems to grow and grow. <laughs> Sometimes it's ludicrously big, his cape. Almost like you wouldn't be able to run around. You'd trip up on it. So his shadow cloak grabs the gun out of his hand. The guy's terrified, of course. And Gideon says, hey, I know you. We were infantrymen in the same unit. I saved your life. And he recognizes him. He's like, Gideon Cross. And he basically says, you can fight me or you can jump off this cliff. And the guy does. He just, rather than fight Demon Hunter, he's just like, oh, I'll just end it all. And uh, down at the party, people hear it. They're like, what the hell is that? Some guy just jumped off the cliff. But uh, the host of the party, the rich guy, uh, his name is Mr. Severs. And he tells everyone not to worry. It's a minor security problem that's been taken care of. Demon Hunter comes down to the party, walks down from the cliff, and uh, he has the ability, he's always wearing this crazy outfit. He has the ability to like cloud men's minds so they see him as just a normal dude. But sometimes he like slips up and forgets. So we see this guy here, who's like, what the hell? And then uh, he's like, oh, I must, have, must be seeing things. Maybe I drank too much. More kind of Kubertiness, but doesn't really quite understand how Kubert draws, I don't think. He doesn't have the skill. So uh, Gideon meets with Severs. Apparently he works for him. He's a hitman slash bodyguard for him. He's his muscle, basically, because Severs is a big time crime boss. Very Kubert there. So he doesn't um, hide himself to him. He knows that he's got this weird outfit. And, but he doesn't know that uh, Demon Hunter really works for the Harvesters of Night. This like mysterious cult. So uh, whenever he does a job for Severs, he gets paid well, you know. But it, there's also this weird thing where every time he does a job for him, he demands that he fill up this flask of blood, of his own blood for him. That's part of the Harvesters of Nights thing. So Severus says, I got another job for you. I got the senior partner and uh, he's been fucking with me big time. In fact, he probably hired that assassin from page two. You can see his love of Neil Adams pop up here and there. Harvey Aldis, that's the name of the senior partner. So after he closes this big deal, he wants him killed. So 
So Demon Hunter's alone in his pad, and he's uh, having lots of doubts about being in the Harvesters of Night. They kind of told him that they were like, oh, we're this organization that wants a worldwide peace, but all he's done for them is kill. So he's like, I don't know about these guys. So then we see two flashbacks intermingling. Kind of an interesting uh, storytelling choice. And uh, we find out that Gideon Cross served in Vietnam. When he came home, there's nobody waiting for him. Meanwhile, in these other interspersed uh, flashbacks, we see him joining the Harvesters of Night. And... Uh, it gave, it gave him a sense of purpose. He's, he was really into it. So back to the other flashback. He goes to see his wife. She's run off with another guy. So he's bitter. He wants to basically hit back at life. Life is fucked with him. And he's going to fuck with life. So he, he was good at shooting. So he becomes a mobster. And uh, for the organization. And, you know, he just spends all his cash on women and whiskey. He's in a really bad place. But, as we see these other flashbacks, the, the cult recruits him. We also find out that ever since he was uh, a kid, he has a sixth sense. Which always made him feel like a freak. But, to the harvesters, it's very valuable. So, that's another reason he's like... Ah, oh, they value me, you know. So uh, Severs uh, wants Gideon to be his bodyguard for this big deal that's going down. It's successful. Severs makes buku bucks. And... Uh, then supposedly he's off to Jamaica to take care of that uh, senior partner. But he doesn't go. First he has a meeting with his contact with the Harvesters of Night. And he's thinking to himself how he's going to withhold the flask of blood until he gets some answers. He's going to question the guy. As he's walking by a newsstand, he sees a headline that says Severs just killed himself. And he knows it's hokum. Severus had it made. Everything was going for him. That guy was not going to kill himself. So he goes into this little storeroom where he's supposed to meet his contact. And the contact isn't there. It's this demon. <laughs> it looks like Gene Simmons' nephew. Kind of a goofy looking demon. With his like spandex heavy metal Gariban. And uh, I guess the cult have sensed his uh, Gideon's discontent, his impending betrayal. So he's gonna he's gonna harvest his blood. He takes the flask of blood from uh, from Gideon. As I guess he's just a low-level demon, so uh, Gideon Cross gets the best of him. And he asks him, why is the flask so important? Tell me, and he won't. He says, I cannot. So he banishes him, using his mystic cloak to a world of desolation, because it's like a portal to a pocket dimension, so he's, or I guess many dimensions, and he just puts his cloak on him and point, he disappears. And uh, Gideon realizes that the cult has betrayed him and, uh, I'm sorry, deceived him and used him. Of course, he's not very happy about it. So instead of going to Jamaica, he goes to Nigeria. At the top of this uh, big hill, this is where he first met the Harvesters of Night. This is kind of the Stonehenge thing. 
And if you walk in between these stones, they're like portals to other parts of the world. Yeah, the art style just jumps around. It's like Neil adams -y. Like I said, we already saw some Kubert. This is like going back to his uh, first influence, Kirby. That looks very Kirby-ish. A little more uh, slicked up, though. So he has another flashback to when he first encountered the Harvesters of Night. Wow, look at that Kubert panel. That's very Kubert. So he does that thing. He walks up between two of the stones and tr is transported to the headquarters, the main sanctum of the Harvesters of Night. And they're doing, they're all of them are involved in this ritual. They're all there. So he knows it's a big deal. So we see them sacrifice, I think, is that Severs? I guess it doesn't matter. It's just, it's a human being. They sacrifice him and they summon Astaroth, Grand Duke of Hell. Kind of looks like Severs though here. I don't know what's going on. These interchangeable mafiosas. Very classic Marvel Comics face. So they're talking about how they're going to achieve Xenogenesis, the rebirth of the demon race. And Astaroth takes over the body of that senior partner, the guy in the wheelchair. He doesn't need the wheelchair anymore because he's got demon power, I guess. And uh, Gideon realizes that they're totally evil and he's got to fight them. So first, though, he flees, though, because he knows he can't take them all on. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, he talks about resurrecting the other 12 from those tombstones. I guess those, uh, that Stonehenge, those were all tombstones of demons or something. So we've got this whole first story arc all ready to go. He's going to be trying to resurrect all these demons and Gideon Cross has got to stop him. So now he flies from Nigeria and he, he's flying to Jamaica now. Because he doesn't know. I don't think he knows that the um, the demon went into the body of that senior partner. So he's going to meet the senior partner, tell him what he knows, and hopefully he'll be an ally with him against this cult. Little does he know, though, on the plane is that guy. The, the home for Astaroth. And he obviously means uh, Gideon ill. <laughs> and then it says, next, the beginning of Xenogenesis. And it's like, no, <laughs> it's the end of Demon Hunter. Fuck. Oh, man. This would have been such a fun comic if it kept going. And that's the end of the issue and Demon Hunter forever. There's no more Demon Hunter ever again. Even though there are Devil Slayer comics. But it wasn't as good Devil Slayer. The backstory in here is perfect. Um, I, I wanted to say though. That's how weird Atlas Seaboard Comics was. Like they were ahead of their time. As far as predicting that comics will get very gritty. In the 80s. Because I mean. Can you imagine Marvel and DC having a character. With such a checkered past. She's basically a a hitman murderer for the mafia and criminal. And even when he becomes demon hunter, he's just killing, you know, villains. He's just a vigilante. And, you know, uh, Marvel had the Punisher, but back in the 70s, don't forget, Punisher was a villain. And he wasn't someone to look up to. He would fight all the superheroes uh, because they wanted to stop his vigilante ways. But, of course, by the time of the 80s, that was seen as a cool thing. That he killed bad guys. So Atlas was already onto that in mid 70s. A lot of their characters kill and they don't even question it. They don't even, 
have a moral dilemma about it. But um, it's just fascinating to me if these went on, like if Atlas continued with this kind of, I don't know, it was, it was a more mature mindset and it was, they would have changed the industry because think of all the 15, 16 year olds who were too old for The Flash and Spider-Man. And they would have been into this. This is like total heavy metal Iron Maiden cover shit. Like, it's cool. It's not like you'd be ashamed to read this when you're 16. You'd be showing it to your friends like, dude, look at this cool demon. And look at this guy kill this guy with some ancient weaponry. I mean, this would have uh, definitely uh, up the demographic of, demographic of comic readers age-wise. If well, not just this comic, most of Atlas's stuff. Not that it was better or worse, but it definitely was way ahead of anything else than DC and Marvel were putting out. But uh, yeah, I'll always lament the fact that there's no more Demon Hunter. Um, I'm gonna keep doing these Atlas Seaboard videos. I have almost every single issue they put out. I'm missing like two. And I think one of them is like the Cowboy comic, which <laughs> I don't think is very good. But, uh, yeah, they still fascinate me. Atlas Seaboard is still preys on my imagination. I still have little daydreams thinking about Atlas Seaboard if they kept going, where they'd be now, what they would have done. It's kind of sick, but I do. And especially Demon Hunter, because it didn't even continue after its first issue. Uh, it's a, a an aborted comic. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And uh, I hope to see you next time here at the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies.